Noah Levine, welcome to the Hell Fucking Yeah podcast. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, for, do for those who don't know, Noah is an American Buddhist teacher and author, uh, notorious for his visionary hybrid of punk rock and Buddhist philosophies. Uh, Noah is truly one of his kind, a pioneer of thinking outside of the box and against the stream. Uh, your practice um, and counseling has helped so many lives and continues to, uh, to this very day, and I'm honored to have you. So thank you for being here again. Thanks, man. Happy to, happy to join you on the podcast. Awesome, man. I'm really excited about this one. Um, so let's start at the beginning. Always a great place to start. Uh, so you lived an entire life before really becoming an adult. <laughs> uh, safe to say that. Um, it is, it is, that's, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> so at a very young age, uh, you exhibited some suicidal behavior, uh, even drug use uh, at age of six around. Um, so now sometime down the road, late 80s, as a teenager, you find yourself in jail. Yeah. Uh, your father, Stephen Levine, uh, who also was a Buddhist teacher and author, uh, called you on a payphone in a juvie and had some words for you. Uh, what were those words and what would you say that moment and I'm sorry would you say that moment was the definitive beginning of your journey and path to Buddhism um so first part what were the words the words were something mm -hmm. like I I I said um you know I thanks for calling uh, you know, of course, internally, I was like, you couldn't fucking show up in person. <laughs> <laughs> Could it, you know, which is another issue, another issue about dear old dad. But yep. thanks, thanks for calling. Yep. And um, I need some help. And, uh, and he launched into this sort of like, well, here's how meditation will help you and how it's helped me. And if you're willing, you know, like, all of your suffering right now is about the past, the actions that got you in this situation, your fear of the future, what's gonna happen at court, you know, all of, mm -hmm. and it was truth. Like what he was breaking down for me was truth. Of course, my feeling was like, I, I wasn't really asking for that kind of help. I was asking for a lawyer, you know, like I, right. was, hoping, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I was hoping to get bailed out, not, not your hippie Buddhist meditation right. shit, but, um, because the, you know, in the second part of that question, so, so basically in that call, he gave me basic Buddhist mindfulness meditation instructions. Mm -hmm. He said, bring your attention to your breath. He says, when you go back to your cell, when you're sitting there, he said, sit up straight on your bed and then bring your attention to the sensations of breathing in and then to the sensations of breathing out and ignore your mind and bring mindfulness to the present moment experience of breathing. So that was the, you know, but the real, I think, precursor to that, the, I grew up with this shit. I thought it was all bullshit. Right. So, but just before that, when I was a suicide attempt, waking up in a padded cell in juvenile hall for the, you know, umpteenth time, I said I had a change of heart, a, a, a realization, a moment of clarity, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm where for the first time in my life, I realized I was in the situation that I was in because of my actions, that I was responsible for the addiction, for the crime, for everything that got me in that situation. Yeah, yeah, there's all kinds of real factors in my life that led to me being a suicidal and, and addicted and trauma and all of, all of that is also true. But my reaction, I was the one choosing to get loaded and commit crimes and hurt myself and hurt people. So that moment of realization, I got myself into this situation also gave me hope. Maybe I could get out. And that was the timing of dad calling and being like, oh, you wanna get free? All right, I'll teach you the spiritual freedom. <laughs> <laughs> and, and me hesitantly being, you know, like, okay, I'll fucking try anything. Sure. It's, uh, I've sunk to such a low state in my life. I will even try something as stupid as meditation. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and then going back to my cell and being like breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, but getting it. I'm like, oh shit, this kind of works a little bit. Sure. This gives me a little bit of relief from my mind and all of the suffering that my mind creates for me. Mm -hmm. Back to the breath, back to the breath. So that was, you know. Absolutely, yeah. So now, I mean, first of all, that's amazing. Um, and meditation doesn't seem so stupid anymore now, right? <laughs> no, of course. I mean, no. it, became, it became, it's become the center of my life, but I was, yeah. you know, I, I had grown up around it. And I feel like so many people don't really understand meditation. Their ideas about it are incorrect. And, um, and I had incorrect ideas about it, but the experience of it gave me some relief. And then the more I learned about it, the more I was like, oh, this shit really makes sense. Yeah. So, and I mean, you were introduced to punk rock too at um, a very young age. So what drew you to that genre when you were younger? Um, you know, I feel like I had a dissatisfaction with the status quo. Mm -hmm. I had a rejection of authority. I had a rebellious, you know, loud uh, expression before I ever heard punk. So when right. I heard punk, when I was like nine years old, I was like, this shit sounds like how I feel. Right. And th this is like putting a soundtrack, you know, before that, like I had heard ACDC or Ted Nugent or some of that early heavy rock. And I was like, oh, that shit's fucking good. I like that. I like loud. I like hard. Yeah. But then punk was this other level of, oh, they're actually saying something political. Mm -hmm. They're saying something intelligent. They're talking about, Anar you know, uh, anarchy. They're mm -hmm. talking about uh, a, a rebellion, like to, to change the world. I was like, this is, you know, this just resonated like the right. voice of God. <laughs> <You know? laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, they're, uh, they're standing up for something they believe in. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you won't get that in a lot of other genres. You know, it's mostly about women or, or you know, glorifying drugs or whatever. Uh, but yes, you got the uh, complete opposite with that kind of music. Um, and of course, there's plenty of bullshit in punk rock too. Of but course. some of those early punk bands and later punk bands, um, you know, were talking about the problems in this world. And I feel like punk rock at its best is this like, um, this vehement, this fierce compassion, this fierce critique of um, you know, and we'll get there, but it's like the Buddha's first noble truth, suffering. Mm -hmm. The truth that there is suffering, no denial, no minimizing, no ignoring. And punk rock is just like this magnifying glass of like, look at all this suffering in the world. Right. Absolutely. So on punk, uh, shortly after getting out of jail, you became highly involved in the straight edge punk scene. Um, yeah. Was it at this time you began to take on the difficult task of combining these two unlikely mediums, punk rock and Buddhism, uh, despite its inevitable success now? Uh, yes, on some level, yes. You know, so there was like three things. I'm 17 years, I'm 18 years old. I'm a street punk. Um, but I also, you know, this is 1988, as early as like 1983 or 84, some of the punk bands were talking about being drug free, minor threats, mm -hmm. straight edge, teen idols, SSD control up in Boston. Like, you know, there was, in, and by the time in 88, there was this whole resurgence of youth of today, bold gorilla biscuits in New York. And then in, in, uh, in LA, there was in, um, you know, Inside Out in San Diego, De La, uh, De La Roche, who became uh, Rage Against the Machine. There was mm -hmm. No for an Answer. Uh, instead, so, you know, like all of there was this resurgence of teenage drug free punks. So that was a perfect, uh, you know, landing place for me philosophically, uh, culturally within the subculture. It's like, okay, I'm a punk. Now I'm a drug free, sober punk. I've got straight edge, yeah. which was, you know, so it was an amazing time because 88 was this real sort of surge of it. And that's when I got sober. And then the other thing was, you know, I'm doing 12 steps. I'm, I'm going to 
recovery. And they're saying you have to have a spiritual solution. Mm -hmm. But it's very theistic. It's all about God. It's all about, it's very, it's almost churchy, the language. Um, and so I was like, oh, I don't, that doesn't, I don't like that. Right. But I'm meditating and meditating is working. And um, in the straight edge scene, a bunch of, and you know, my dad's this Buddhist Hindu, like I grew up around all, uh, and in the straight edge scene, youth of today, Ray and Purcell, and, and they become Hare Krishnas, they become Hindus. And so now I'm listening to spiritual hardcore, you know, this sort of like Hindu punk. And I'm, and I'm like, oh, Hinduism is cool. That's kind of like Buddhism. And my dad was like a half Hindu, half Buddhist. And so it really fit right. for me to have that sort of young adult, spiritual punk. But I was at odds both with the 12 steps and with the Hindus because I don't believe in God. Mm -hmm. And, you know, th those guys are talking about Krishna and Krishna's God, you know, it's a, it's a blue Jesus. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and I'm just like, yeah, like, I, I like the nonviolence. I like the vegetarianism. I like what you guys are talking about, but then you're talking about God all of the time and I don't buy it. Right. And same thing in recovery. They're talking about service. They're talking about uh, integrity. I was like, I like all of that, but then you're talking about God. I don't buy it. It was in Buddhism that I found spiritual integrity, this work that you can do to train your mind to wake up, no God. There's, you know, it's non-theistic. So that's where I was a little bit, like I had support in the straight edge scene, I had support in the 12 step scene, I had support in the Buddhist scene, but I didn't have any Buddhist recovery or any Buddhist punk rock. I had the Hindu punks, but I didn't have any Buddhist punks. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where like Dharma punks was born from. Right. So, I mean, yeah, essentially you created this. Um, so would you say it was important for <clears throat> the youth of America or well, anywhere in the world really, um, who were going down a troubled path to mend these two worlds together? Um, and did you find any stark similarities in the two when you did that? Yeah, I mean, for sure, it's, um, you know, who knows? I had a little crew. I had a little crew of, of my homies that were like, yeah, this shit makes sense. And we're meditating in my living room and we're listening to hardcore and we're, you know, we're doing it. Right. And then I was like, okay, well, this is my life and my little crew. I wonder, I, you know, I, I want to dedicate my life to being of service. Um, I was in school, in graduate school, and one of my teachers was like, you've lived such a, like you said in the beginning, <laughs> what an interesting life you've lived before you even, you know, before you were even 20. Right. Um, and I, he's like, you should write about it. And so I was like, oh shit, okay. I started writing and I wrote Dharma Punks with this, maybe this will help others. I hope this help others. Sure. Just like in recovery where we share our experience, strength, and hope, and that's how we learn from each other. I was like, I'll do that in a book about how recovery and Buddhism and punk rock and, you know, my life unfolded in this way. And the outcome was people loved it, you know, and Dharma Punk's groups sprouted up all over the country, you know, because I have this DIY attitude where people were coming to me and like, I read the book, I'm into it, but the Buddhists in my, you know, town are lame. And I was like, start a Dharma Punk's group. And all of a sudden there's 30, there's 40 Dharma punks groups all over around, you know, around the country. Yeah. Um, and so it was just this like, okay, this resonates. And it's not anything that I really made up. It's just, I put it down. And all of these people that are like, yeah, I'm down with that. Right. Showed up. Yeah. It, it, well, essentially, no matter what you think of, you know, your part in it, you created a movement. So it's pretty amazing. Um, so you began your career in the 90s, visiting juvenile halls and prisons, uh, speaking of the merits of drug-free life, uh, free of uh, a prison-free life, and being free of past trauma through meditation. Um, so would you say helping others kept you on the straight and narrow, or were there any major moments of uncertainty that could have led, led you back to your past life? And, and, and I mean, by that, I mean, not uncertainty in your work or your message, but rather solely in yourself. Um, 
yes, helping others, you know, being of service, trying to uh, both, you know, we learn this, like being generous, being compassionate, being of service is absolutely a good thing to do for others. And there's some altruism in it. And a lot of it is about our own healing. You know, when I, I was such a self-centered, angry, self-hatred person, all of that work and going into the prisons and juvenile homes, I was there to try to help, but I was also there to heal my own wounds. Sure. And that's, you know, often how it goes. Um, were there moments of, I don't, you know, no big ones. You know, weird, okay, yeah, weirdly, yeah. weirdly enough, no, like, no near relapses or no, I mean, I've had some terribly painful experiences over the last 32 years that I've been sober. Um, but none of it that ever convinced me that going a different direction would be better. Getting loaded would be, I always felt like this is incredibly painful, this loss, this grief, this whatever's going on. But I'm so grateful that I know about forgiveness and compassion and love and service and abstinence as the foundation, staying sober as the foundation to get through these difficulties. They say in yeah. recovery, they say, there's nothing that a drink wouldn't make worse. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And I, and I tend to you know, believe that and have always sort of rolled with that like, oh yeah, this is bad. But if I get loaded, it'll be worse. Right. Absolutely. So yeah. you've earned a master's degree in counseling psychology. And still to this very day, you're a counselor, teacher, mentor, inspiration for many. And you focus very highly on Dharma Buddhism. Uh, so for those who may not know, what is Dharma and why is it most important to you? Um, like I was saying before, like when I got sober and I had the 12 steps and they're offering an open-minded Christian theology or Judeo-Christian. Um, and my father, you know, and his folks are doing this kind of like Hindu devotional, uh, their gurus and all of that. And um, I had all, you know, when I, I started studying, I was like, okay, what are they saying in the Hindus? What are the Christians saying? What are the Jews? You know, my father was a Jew who had rejected it. What is, what is this about? Let me write, read the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the Sufis, what are, oh, they're Muslims. Oh, what do the Muslims have to say? Let me study the Quran a little bit. So I did in my early 20s, a little bit of like a, uh, what do they call that? Like interdenominational religious studies course on my own through just like eating up literature and right. going to the mosque and going to the Sufis and chanting with the Hare Krishnas and meditating with the Tibetans and the Zen and the, you know, like I just, I got, hung, I'm an addict, you know? So like, if there's something that's good, I'm like, well, you know, I want all of it. I'm gonna check right. it all out. Right. But for me, as I said before, all of the stuff where there's this sort of mystical God, higher power, that every, all of the meaning is being assigned to, and all of the philosophies that in any way is saying human beings uh, are dependent on grace, or dependent on some divine, none of that shit ever resonated, never made sense. Now, I'll tell you the truth. There was a part of me, especially early on, I was like, I hope this is true. I, I wish I could meet a guru that would magically, you know, get rid of all of my suffering. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm lazy, I don't want to do the work. <laughs> and Buddhism is saying, you got to do all the work yourself. Yeah. You, you know, you got to train your mind. You. So there was just something about my investigation and my practice that led me to feel like this is, as far as religion goes, as far as spirituality goes, psychology makes a lot of sense to me and Buddhism is very close. It's, it's sort of a humanist psychology. And so I landed in, uh, that's what makes sense to me. And then the direct, this verified faith based on I'm meditating, I'm going to retreats, I'm, my mind is changing, my relationship to my mind is changing. I'm seeing it as I teach other people how it works for them. It's not an isolated thing. So all of this evidence that I'm on a path that not only makes sense for me, but that also now I'm able to help all of these other people find something that makes sense to them. Right. So yeah, I mean, that's amazing too. Um, I'll be honest with you, I don't you know, know too much about it. Um, but I've always 
I've always been attracted to it, you know, maybe like the um, uh, materialistic attraction to it. Like I always loved the look of the Buddha or, or any of those kind of things. Sure. Um, but there was always, it was always there. So, and just over the past few days, just reading about you and, um, you know, I got your book here and that's your first one. We'll get to your book soon. Um, I learned a lot. I'm very interested in it and I want to keep learning about it. So, uh, this is great not only for the listeners, but for, for me. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, and I'm so happy to, to be here and have this conversation. And I can give a, like the simplest explanation of Buddhism mm -hmm. is the four noble truths. This is, you know, the Buddha woke up and then he said, here's how I woke up. Here's how we can wake up. First, stop denying the suffering in your life. Accept mm -hmm. it. There is suffering. We all have it. No matter how good your life is, there's still some suffering. There's a cause to the suffering. It's repetitive craving. It's, it's you know, wanting life to be pleasant all of the time. Mm. And, like, and we're just like, yep, I've got that. I've got that. <laughs> the, thir <laughs> the third truth is it's possible to live a life of responding appropriately to pleasure and pain so that you don't suffer. So that you're not attached and addicted to pleasure. You're not aversive to pain. You develop compassion and not non-attachment to get to that place of freedom there's eight areas of our life mm -hmm. what do we understand what are our intentions how do we speak to how do we act what do we, what's our relationship to livelihood to money how much effort are we willing to put into and the trainings in mindfulness and concentration this is the eightfold path and it's a practical applicable guide to living in reality, not some spiritual fantasy, right. but really like, how am I speaking? How am I behaving? What kind of karma am I creating in this world with my actions? Yeah. And how am I training my mind? Because the untrained mind without meditation is a setup for suffering. Yeah. With meditation, there's some intervention in how the mind operates and how we respond to the self-centered human condition that we all have. Right. Yeah, wow, that's, that's crazy because, you know, I've never been, I'm never, not a religious person, never have been. Um, it always kind of turned me off, but there's something about this that's, it's more, like you just said, it's more focused on yourself and your actions yeah. more than being a, um, you know, idolizing something. So it's yeah, there should cool. originally, you know, but this is the same, like when we start getting into religion, um, certainly Jesus Christ was not trying to create Christianity mm. <laughs> <laughs> and he would be fucking appalled at what they're doing in his name for the last 2000 years. Right, we right. know <laughs> that any, any sane person knows like Jesus would be pissed. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'd say the same thing about Buddha. He wasn't trying to create a religion and he, you know, and he's over and over was trying to empower people and give them this practical path. But what do people do? They turn it into a religion and they start worshiping Buddha statues and they start, you know, ascribing all of this stuff to Jesus that wasn't part of his humans fuck up everything, you know, and they turn it <laughs> and, and religion, religion is like more of a problem than a solution yeah. in our world. It gives people a bunch of comforting delusions to comfort us from all of the suffering that religion has been creating for us. You know, right. it's like, I'll go on a rant about, go for it. And the reason I go there <laughs> is because even Buddhism has lost its way. Yeah. You know, the, the, there's the Four Noble Truths, there's the Eightfold Path, but 90% of Buddhists don't even meditate. They're worshiping statues and they've turned it into a devotional thing. That's not what the dude was talking about. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, they, we seem to do that with everything, but yes. We do, yeah. yeah. Um, so now let's uh, get into your books a little bit. Um, you're the author of several books. In order of release, you got Dharma Punks, Against the Stream, The Heart of the Revolution, Kind Awareness, and most, uh, most recently, um, Refuge Recovery. Uh, what would you say is ultimately the most important progression in each of these works, not only for the reader, but for yourself as a recovering addict. Right. Um, 
you know, Dharma Punks is my story. It's a memoir. So it's right. like, hey, this is what happened in my life that, and how Buddhism works in my life. Mm -hmm. And so then as that was out and there was some uh, success and appreciation with it, I was like, okay, now I better break down what I'm talking about here. Because right. I really did Dharma Punks from first person. I'm not teaching you. I'm telling you what I'm learning, you know, what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So in Against the Stream, I was like, okay, the Buddha was a revolutionary, you know, and, and here's how radical it is and how much it fits with rebellion and that actually waking up is rebellion. And here's a guide to the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. And here's how we can, you know, change not only from the inside, but how it's an act of social and political and environmental uh, transformation to wake up. Right. So that was against the stream. And then from against the stream, I wanted to go deeper into loving kindness and compassion and forgiveness, what we call the heart practices. How do we wake up our heart without it being some woo woo hippie spiritual make believe shit? Really, how do I respond to pain with friendliness? I don't know how to do that. Nobody knows how to do that. We all hate pain. Right. But we have these meditation practices that teach us to first learn to tolerate pain, then we eventually have some mercy for pain, which will lead to a compassionate response, uh, appropriately responding. And so heart of the revolution is like, how do we train our hearts in this revolutionary you know, way so that you, know, you don't have to lose your edge, you don't have to stop swearing, you don't have to, you know, you can still be hell fucking yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it can be hell fucking yeah, I care and I love and I wanna be part of the solution and not part of the problem. Right. So all of that, you know, early on, so then refuge recovery, kind awareness is really just like a, um, a CD uh, set. It's not really a book, it's like an online, some okay. lecture, some guided meditations. Um, so it's like a resource for people. Sure. But refuge recovery, you know, I got sober at 17. I started about 10 years later, really teaching at about my late twenties. But when I started teaching and when I was uh, empowered, trained and empowered and, and all of that, there was a conscious choice. Am I going to be the recovery guy and exclude you in recovery? You're not right. No. Yeah, as I was like, there was like, I was like, I don't want to ex exclude Mike. You right. know, like, I, I don't want, I don't want to be like, hey, this is only for junkies. You can't come meditate with us. Right, right. <laughs> so I made a conscious decision to be like, I want to um, do something where everyone's welcome. If you're an addict, you'll relate because that's my experience. And, sure. you know, but if you're not an addict, if you've ever suffered, you'll relate, <laughs> you know, and here's a way. So I set up against the stream and Dharma Punks as this sort of open, inclusive thing. But what happened is that more and more people started coming and saying, I'm an addict and I hate the 12 steps or I don't hate it, but Buddhism makes more sense to me. Can't we have a Buddhist recovery program? And I was like, yeah, that's a fucking great idea. Somebody should do that. Sure. So that actually- But nobody was doing it. I even right. like, I got involved in this uh, Buddhist recovery network. We started this nonprofit and I was like, cool. Like a whole bunch of us, we're gonna start a Buddhist recovery network. And then I got involved with them and they were like, no, no, we don't wanna start a program. We just wanna give people in 12 step recovery, Buddhist resources. And I was like, that's good. That's cool. That's, but I want actually a Buddhist recovery program. So I started to work on it. I was like, okay, let's take the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path and, you know, use some of the structure of the 12 steps of peer-led meetings and let's do this. Sure. And so that was my last book. And that was, you know, six, seven years ago. And I've been just like dedicating my life to building that right. and supporting that. And, you know, hundreds of people, thousands of people coming through and saying, oh, cool, this makes sense. This makes sense in a way that nothing else had. Sure. So yes. would you say uh, Refuge Recovery then would be the most accessible book for anyone, like all people? Uh, let's say- No, no, recovery. no. Refuge, just for addicts. If you're struggling with addiction, read Refuge Recovery. Okay, okay. If you're in recovery for a long time, read Refuge Recovery. Gotcha. <laughs> if, it's, if, it's, um, if that's not your issue. If you're already really interested, read Against the Stream, and heart of the revolution 
if you're not so interested, start with Dharma punks. Okay. Like your experience, right? Like if you, right. this is what I like teenagers all of the time, like they read Dharma punks and they're like, it got me interested. Sure. Then against the stream, heart of the revolution. Refuge really is just for the people struggling with addiction. Gotcha. Okay. Or so, in their that, own process of recovery. That actually brings me to my next question, which is regardless of anyone's situation, uh, what would you say is the greatest aspect of Buddhism that all people could adapt into their everyday lives, especially in these uncertain, crazy, fucked up, nutty times that we live in? <laughs> well, you know, there's something, um, you know, the, the answer is mindfulness. But on some level, I, 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 um, I want to give a different answer just to be contrarian. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you've seen it. I mean, like what has happened in our culture is that, that now there's mindfulness psychotherapy and there's mindfulness medicine and there's mindfulness-based stress reduction and there's mindful exercising. And like mindfulness, this term mindfulness, this practice of mindfulness is Buddhism. The Buddha created mindfulness. But what a bunch of people have done is they've extracted it from Buddhism and made it medical, psychological, health, wellness. And in that way, it's great because, as you said, especially in this time of chaos and COVID and crazy politics and human suffering and ignorance that, as it's always been, but it seems especially intense right now. It's magnified, yes. <laughs> it's magnified. Um, mindfulness gives you the tool to get out of your head, get out of the future, what's going to happen on November 4th. <laughs> <laughs> get out of your, yeah. get out of the resentments about, I can't believe what I saw on the news this morning. Um, and come back to the present right now. It's like this present time, non-judgmental awareness, let go of the future and past, come back to the here and now, there's great relief in that. Right. Most of the time we're suffering about something that already happened or something that hasn't happened yet. Yeah, <laughs> that's very true. So mindfulness cuts through that suffering. Right. Now my second answer, second answer is sure. it's compassion. Like we just need to have compassion for Simple, each other, right? compassion for <laughs> ourselves, compassion yeah. for the incredible ignorance and the legacy of racism, of, of slavery, of sexism, of homophobia, of all of the forms of oppression that everyone's suffering so loud about. Mm -hmm. Compassionately caring, caring passionately about both those who've been oppressed and the oppressors. And this gets completely forgotten where we think like, no, no, that we have to have like, there's the good and the bad rather than they're suffering all over. And the oppressors, the racist, the ignorant people are suffering. The karma of that ignorance of that conditioning is unbearable. Yeah. And compassion and of course being oppressed and being, you know, in, in uh, you know, these experiences in this culture and in every culture, uh, it's worthy of compassion. But then we have, to, we have to move to forgiveness. We have to move to uh, stop hating each other. The Buddha said something very simple. Hatred will never cease by more hatred. Yeah. By love alone does hatred cease. Right. So as long as we keep hating those who hate, we just add more hate to the world. Right. But if we can start to have compassion and we can start to have forgiveness with appropriate boundaries and appropriate consequences and, you know, lock the crooks up. I'm all for that. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Of course. You know? Yeah. But really getting around. So mindfulness, absolutely good practice. But also, like, we have to train our hearts to be more loving, ultimately, Absolutely. more compassionate. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with that more, you know? I mean, listen, we've all been there. We've all been angry at things or, or uh, have hated things or people for whatever reason. Um, it's such a negative feeling. It, it, drains, it drains you, you know? 
it's uh, it's not a way to live. So it's uh, it's a very good, very good message. And uh, I hope everyone listens to this. And even if a couple people get it, it's good enough. Um, so for anyone looking to read your books, uh, where can they find them? Um, besides like Amazon, obvious. Can you do you get digital and audible and stuff like that? Yeah, there's a couple of them are on audible. The um, Dharma Punks um, and Refuge Recovery. The other two aren't, um, aren't, aren't recorded. Yeah, of course, you know, you can order it online. Um, the best way for sort of me and my community is if you order it directly from againstthestream.com, mm -hmm. because then we make a couple bucks on the book sale. So if you order it directly from us, it's actually my mom uh, runs my website. Oh, nice. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so every time she sells a book, she makes a few bucks. I don't, I don't even get a cut, but she gets it. And, uh, that's cool. It supports that's her, moms. which is, which is, yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to support her in that way. Yeah, well, everyone out there, support uh, Noah's mom and head on over to againststream.com, get some books. Yeah. yeah. Um, so are you still holding meetings? Uh, can people come see you speak or meditate with you? Yeah, uh, I do a weekly, um, I do two things a week on Zoom. So, you know, I know you're on the okay. East Coast, people for all, from all over yep. on um, Monday nights, people I, uh, on, through againststream.com. My yeah. Monday night, 7.30 Pacific time, uh, I do every Monday night. And that's a, I do a guided meditation and then a lecture and some Q&A. Um, and that's for everyone. Everyone's welcome to that. Wow, and it's great. free. It's by donation. You know, it's, it's you know, uh, I, I also do that live. If you're in LA, I have a meditation center in Venice. People can come down and come into the room and socially distance and wear their mask and meditate together. Yeah. That's okay, too. Great. So that's still... That's still, that's still happening. happening. Oh, yeah, great, that's great, still great. happening Mon Monday nights. And then Thursday nights, I do something for Refuge Recovery that's mm -hmm. called on refugerecovery.org. And again, that's a Zoom. Both of these, we do Zooms, but then we, like you're doing, um, then we stream them to uh, YouTube. And okay. then they're, you know, so then they're archived on YouTube. Um, so people can watch the old ones if they miss it live. And Thursday nights is really just for people in recovery where I do a lecture about refuge recovery. Right now we're going through the guided meditations. Last night we did uh, forgiveness or compassion practice. Next week we're doing another compassion practice. So for recovery people, refugerecovery.org is the place to come um, for the Thursday nights. Fantastic. So now there's also noahlevine.com uh, where you can, you don't use it anymore? I don't use, I mean, you say, I mean, I don't use it much. Okay. Well, the only reason I was bringing it up was because I noticed yeah. on there, there was one-on-one -on -one online consulting. Yes. Is that something you still do? And is there another spot on the, the web to get to it? Yeah. No, people can, um, you know, send me an email through that website if they want to do a counseling session or, you know, develop that relationship. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm so busy that I'm not really promoting that right now okay. because I've, I've got my plate full and I'm working on a new book. And maybe one of the things that you didn't, um, see but you'll see soon is there's a brand new documentary called uh dharma rebel noah levine yep. that just got released um but they're only you know they're trying to do film festivals but how do you do film festivals in you know the age of covid and the, the lockdown right. so they're doing online film festivals but what they're doing for online film festivals is they're blocking the uh region so you can only, like they just did it in San Francisco, but you could only watch it online if you were in California. And so then, you know, eventually they'll do a New York film yeah. festival and you'll only be able to watch it if you're in New York, but it's not available for everyone's uh, viewing yet. Gotcha. You know, that was actually, I was getting to that next. Because okay, uh, okay. I, I went to go watch it. Yeah. And I signed in with the Facebook thing and it was like, you know, it was cheap. It was like 10 bucks. I was like, oh, hell yeah. And then, uh, yeah, it said, you don't live in California. So bye-bye. Um, but when can we all see it and uh, where? You don't know yet? Don't know yet. I mean, the, the director and producer, you know, of course, I'm just the subject, so I don't have any, any, any juice in it. They, right. they, they, um, but, they, you know, they're trying to do film festivals, but it's just really difficult right now to release a, an online film. I mean, ideally, if, you know, uh, Netflix or somebody like that picked it up, then everybody could see it. And eventually, Actually, after she's done some screenings, I'm sure she'll do something like where it'll be on Vimeo or, or something like that. But she's just waiting to do a few more film festivals. Sure. So now yeah. for other people, too, that are interested in what you have to say or um, looking for some inspiration or motivation, uh, you can subscribe to Noah's podcast, Against the Stream. 
Yeah. Uh, it's available on Apple, Google, Spotify, um, and follow Noah Levine at Noah Levine 108 on Insta. Um, so before we get into the favorite segment, is there anything else you'd like to mention or add? No, I mean, I appreciate you've, you know, you've kind of set it up. Like if people are looking for refugerecovery.org, against the stream.com, uh, those are the resources. Um, so that's, that's it. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so this is my, my favorite part. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple of your favorites. Sometimes it's a little tough because it's hard to pick a favorite of things, but uh, we're going to go for it. Um, so this is probably going to be a tough one, but favorite punk album. Like it what's the tough. one that's, you know, if someone I mean, said I you got to pick one. <laughs> I don't know. It's like, I want to pick The Clash, mm. but um, I want their whole discography. Yeah, that counts. Pick one, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, I want to yeah, like, pick like a best of, but that doesn't count. I might, even though like I didn't like it when, I, when it came out, I might actually pick something like Sandinista of The okay. Clash. You know, double album, right. and there's some, you know, there's some punk, and then there's some really mellow, sort of weird, jazzy punk on there. Yeah, so it's, a little it's more hard experimental. Yeah. The older I get, the you know, this change, this question changes. <laughs> sure, it's understandable. I and the mood, thing. right? Of course, of course. Yeah. You know, something that, something that's timeless. You know, you'll like from when you're a little kid, and, until forever. But uh, so yeah, things change as, as you get older. I, definitely. I listen to I listen to everything from the beginning to the end, you know. Uh, so if someone asked me that, I probably wouldn't be able to answer it. But I don't know. I'm, I'm an asshole. I like to uh, put people on the spot. <laughs> um, so favorite curse word. This is an easy one. <laughs> or not. Probably okay. fuck. I mean, probably the you know if I it was probably fuck that came out of my mouth most as far as like most used, but. Um, Ah, you know, there's so, there's so many, uh, you know, and I've got, I've got kids and I love, like, I love my kids to swear and kids right. are the best at swearing They're so good because at they put together, <laughs> you know, unusual combinations and it's just, you know, <laughs> they, they call, you know like, you know, my, my son is like, Hey, you butt douche nozzle fart <laughs> tongue. And I'm just like, you win. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> And as far as, you know, same thing with fuck too. It go, there's so many variations on it. You know, you got motherfucker, you got fuck yeah. faces. There's so many good ones. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's, so, that's always a classic. Um, how about favorite Buddhist quote? <laughs> nah, I really put you on the spot. I mean, that's, I mean, it's a, <laughs> I mean, that one, I'm just going to go with the one that I already said because it's just mm -hmm. in my mind that, sure. Hatred never ceases by more hatred. By love alone does hatred cease. Yeah. Um, but, I, and I don't, you know, like what I, this, my second, you know, is um, that all beings have the power and potential to free themselves from suffering. And that's, you know, that's it. Like that really, we're not powerless. We're not victims of, we can change. And that's, you know, part of the, the, the Buddhism that I, that I love. Absolutely. I'm going to bring up some pictures from Instagram. And if we, for the listeners, if we can just describe the picture a little bit and then tell me what's going on in it. Sure. So here we go. <clears throat> All right, here we go. We got uh, Noah. <laughs> it's a, <laughs> it's a black, and, black the... and white photo. Um, yeah. Standing here with the guitar, smiling, looking, looking great. Uh, so what's going on here? <laughs> That's a picture. We're, um, we're at a silent meditation retreat or towards the end of a silent meditation retreat. I think that um, my buddy who's managing the retreat, Joseph, picked that guitar up at like a secondhand store in town. We're in Port Townsend, Washington, all the way up on the northwest, you know, edge of the United States. And um, we're actually this retreat. Remember the movie Officer and a Gentleman? Yes. This retreat is at that uh, barracks that they filmed that whole movie at. So, oh, wow. you know, th that's where we're at. We're up there. Um, and I just like, you know, pick, I was just, I don't even play guitar. I just picked up the guitar. Somebody took a picture. You see everybody's shoes behind me. Like everybody's over there <laughs> meditating and I'm fucking around with the guitar. And I'm wearing the Youth of Today 1985 Youth Crew jacket. Nice. Jacket. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, that was going to be my next question. Do you play guitar at all? Play any instrument? I don't. 
You don't? I never, I never really picked anything up, no. Well, I'm just you're, posing. You're, you're a great speaker. I, I really appreciate the way you, um, you talk. It's inspiring to me because I'm trying to like, you know, get into my groove over here and uh, find my voice. And you're, you're a phenomenal speaker. So Thanks. you don't need, you don't need an instrument. Your voice is your instrument. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a uh, wild one. That's, okay. um, I'm teaching, it's a Wanderlust Yoga Festival. And there's, as you can see, there's are thousands of people out there. And yeah. this is this festival that I was doing for a few years where we would start by running a 5K. They called it a, a, a mindful triathlon where we'd run a 5K and then there'd be yoga for about an hour and then I'd do like a 30 minute meditation. Um, I can't, I think that might be Chicago but I can't actually t tell where that is. That's not New York, is it? No. It's not New York. I, Chicago New York. sounds right, looks right. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, yeah, if you can't, if you're listening to this and not watching the video, there yeah. is a ton of people here and uh, Noah's on the stage here, uh, you know, doing his thing. We were getting, um, we were getting between 1,500 and I think the biggest one was New York where there was almost 10,000 people wow. and, you know, so that's a, that's a wild thing to sit on stage and teach meditation to thousands of people. So now, I mean, it seems like the complete opposite of a concert. Like how quiet was it? Did you hear anything or just the birds? No, it mostly, <laughs> mostly got quiet. You know, people would sort of settle in, but there's vendors in the back and there's, you know, people over there, you know, like you're doing it in and out. You're in a public park. Like there's, there's some noise around, but it's okay because also I would just give the instruction to bring the sound into the meditation, you know, right. like include it all. Right, very cool, very cool. All right, up next. This, anytime I see a picture with pizza, because I love pizza. I just had yeah. pizza before I even started this interview. Oh. Um, I, eat, I live in New York, so I eat it like for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah. Uh, so I had to bring this up, I had to see where this pizza was from. And did, you find, did you find out? Did you, did you do some research? I, I know the answer, but... Yeah. Uh, I, I know I know exactly where it have is. Have you ever had a slice of that pie? You know I haven't, and it's it's crazy because I live. How, how about Sal and Peppy's? Yes, or? yes, definitely. I lived in Connecticut for a while. Okay. Um, I grew up here in Long Island. Yeah. My wife and I moved in 2009 to Connecticut, and we stayed for a little while. And you know, our first concern was, oh shit, I hope the pizza's good. You know, coming from New York. Yeah. Uh, New Haven pizza is top it's of the amazing. market. It's amazing. Yeah. So this is modern. Pizza. This is modern a pizza. Right. Um, <laughs> and you know, I had some, I had some homies from New Haven. Mm -hmm. Um, so I started going to New Haven in the early nineties and they were like, you got to eat this pizza. And you know, I'm a California kid. I don't know what a good pizza is. You know, I fucking, we were eating at round table or some pizza. Right. <laughs> um, California and it, just, pizza it just blew my mind. <laughs> and actually I think in this picture, I believe like I was teaching a lot up in, um, up in Massachusetts, like Western mass. Mm -hmm. out in the Berkshires and it's like a two hour drive to New Haven but I would drive down from my retreat to New Haven I'm with my friend Becky Tupper in this picture who's a, a local in New Haven and I'd go down there just to get a pie you know and this oh, is like a, this is an eggplant and garlic and you know they do the eggplant like like eggplant parmesan where it's breaded it's fried and then it's on the pizza and you know you know that that delicious oh, yeah. so yeah well um, delicious so I only had you know, Sally's and Pepe's. We actually did that in one day. We tried to like compare them side to side. Yeah. Uh, which one do you prefer uh, of those two? Well, <laughs> I might go, I, you know, I'm a modern, you know, like I, I've got, I've got loyalty to, to modern. Of course. But I, I think I'd go with, with Frank Pepe's. Okay. I think I'd go, yeah, I think I'd go Frank Pepe's. Yeah. But yeah. Sal's is great too. Like they're, they're all three amazing. Like, I love Sally's because it's, just, it's so old school when you go in there. Yeah. They don't take a credit. I mean, neither one of them really take a card. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I mean, literally the register had a crank on it. I mean, it's, it's insane. I think it's, you know, those are three <laughs> of the best pizzas on the planet right up there. They're really good. All right. So uh, now we have Noah standing next to two Buddhist monks. Um, where, where is this and what's going on? I'm in you know. Thailand. We're in Bangkok, Thailand. Huh? And uh, every December, except for this year, I'm not going to be able to go because of COVID. 
Um, I go out there and I spend some time with my teachers. So those two uh, men have been my teachers for almost 30 years. That's wow. Ajahn Amaro and Ajahn Pasano. And then their teachers are there, Ajahn Sumedho, this whole lineage of Buddhist monks. Um, and that I met when I was like 20. And um, I've continued to study with them and practice with them. And so I go out there and get, you know, get a little visit time and do a retreat and, you know, connect with my roots. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. So unfortunately you can't go this year, uh, but you plan on going next year. Yeah. It doesn't look like it's going to happen this year, but who knows know. what's going to happen in this world? You know, like when are we going to open up? When are, is it ever going to be, you know, who knows? Who knows? I know. And speaking of that, uh, how you've been faring through all this? You all right? <laughs> family, Most family's good? mostly all right kids are good, good. you know kids good. are doing homeschool all of that stuff and in a lot of ways like i've i've loved the opportunity to have more downtime i'm getting real busy in it again you know like doing all these podcasts and stuff yeah yeah <laughs> but but i'm enjoying the downtime not Absolutely. traveling so much yeah it, i mean essentially it gave me this opportunity so i can't be too mad yeah pretty good. <laughs> all right so um now we have black and white photo of Noah sitting on the steps, head down in his, in his arm, folded arms. Yeah. Very reminiscent of Minor Threat album cover. Yeah. Um, and tattoo on the head. So I, haven't, I didn't see that in all the pictures. Is that fairly new? I got that last December when I was okay. in Probably, you know, when I was, uh, I forget how many years ago that pr last picture was. But yeah, this is a hand poked Thai. Uh, kind of Buddhist tattoo that I got done on my head last last year, um, yeah. And of course, I'm I'm doing the minor threat pose that <laughs> Rancid also ripped off for their for their uh, you know outcome the wolves uh, record. Less, less, and, less rip off, more homage. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Total homage. Um, and, um, so yeah, we actually we're also using this image for the uh, movie poster for Dharma Rebel. Oh, fantastic! Awesome. Yeah. Um, so hand poked tattoo. Um, I was always kind of curious about that. Yeah. It, it, does it hurt more than a regular tattoo? It hurts a little bit less. It hurts a little bit less. Does it, and I'm yeah. assuming it takes a lot more time. Or you same know, <laughs> I, I, I would assume that it would take a little bit more time, but it doesn't seem like it, but, but also these ones that I'm getting, they're not shaded in, they're not as detailed, right? They're kind of mm. line work tattoos. So they don't take that long okay. um, because they don't have the shading and coloring and stuff that you're often doing on, on big tattoos. Gotcha. Now, are most of yours, you know, straight gun tattoos or, or yeah. a lot of- Yeah, except, except for my head. You know, I've That's done the, I did the okay. top and the back of my head. And those are the, they're called sock yonts, uh, is the Thai word and they're, you know, it's a traditional thing that a lot of Buddhists and Buddhist monks do. And they're, you know, the reality is they're these sort of like protection things that I don't even believe in. I just think they look cool. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Hell fucking yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So last but not least, we got Noah uh, flipping the bird. Um, and then what is this? Is just this okay? It's called a mudra. Okay. Um, so, you know, all of there's like, you know, how we have gang signs, like, mm -hmm. you know, Buddhists have gang signs too. <laughs> and like all of the different fingers like mean something. Right. Um, and so, you know, we all know what the middle finger means. Of course. And then this is like a teaching mudra. mudra. It's like when the, it's not, it's not like, okay, like that. It's straightforward. Uh, thumb, finger, fingers up. It means that you're teaching the Dharma. Okay. And so it's like, you know, um, the Dharma of fuck you. <laughs> gotcha. So I, would say, <laughs> I would say after reading about you and, and, you know, doing this interview with you, this really sums you up. In, in, yeah, totally. In Absolutely. Totally. So yeah. I, had, I had to grab that one. Very cool. Uh, so let's go back to our regular screen here. And um, that's pretty much going to wrap it up, man. Um, so I have to ask everybody. On a scale from one to hell fucking yeah, how stoked were you to be here today? Oh, I was very stoked. Hell yeah. Hell fucking awesome. yeah. This was awesome. This was fun. And you're great. You do your research. You, you know, you thank you. you, you I give a that. good interview. It's cool to do with you. And I wish you, you know, only success in in this uh, carrying on. 
Well, thank you so much for that. That means a lot. And thank you for your inspiration, man, uh, on many levels, not only um, of what you teach and what you speak of, but uh, just the way you fucking do what you do, man. Uh, just the way you speak is, is really, really uh, awe-inspiring to me. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, you're welcome back anytime. I'd love to have you again. Cool, man. Great to meet you. Great to meet you too, man. I really appreciate right. this. Talk Thank you, you so much, Noah. All right. Talk Bye. to you later.